Well, we're up to number three in our series on Ephesians, which brings us up to the 15th verse of chapter 1. And I'm going to read a few verses. And so I think it's nine verses to be exact. So I need verse 15, chapter 1 of Ephesians. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to thank to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. If you looked at the front of your bulletin this morning, it speaks about spiritual riches. And do you know what riches are yours? And that's really what um, the word that the Lord spoke through Georgia was referring to, too. And that's really what the sermon text is about today. Do you have unclaimed riches? Do you know what is yours and yet have not appropriated them or laid hold of them or believed them or relied upon them? So that's really the essence of what the Lord is speaking to us today through this word. A few years ago, the worship team at the Sign of the Dove Church was having a typical Thursday evening practice at their facility down on 10th Street. I wasn't there, but I'm sure that there were the normal irritations anytime you meet for a worship practice. Karen's smiling already because you're a worship leader and you have a worship practice. There are normal irritations, are there not, Karen? You know, someone didn't show up. A couple people were late. Some of the singers just couldn't get their part or thought they should do it a different way. And someone took a cell phone call in the middle of a song. But you know, on that Thursday night as they met for worship practice, all their normal concerns, all the normal people irritations changed in an instant when the whole building shook and the roof at the opposite end of the platform collapsed bringing down part of the balcony, bringing down the fire sprinkler pipes that flooded the whole building. And everyone just ran for their lives out through the fire exits off either side of the platform, just happy to be alive. I've seen people in the midst of a heart attack. They're experiencing a heart attack. They're about to have surgery. They're about to be wheeled back, not knowing if they're going to survive or not. And all their normal worries and concerns and pettiness is out the window. All that matters at that point is, are they going to live or die? And the relationships they have with their closest loved ones. We can be consumed, can we not, with where to go on vacation? Or should we buy a bigger flat screen TV for the living room? Or is this the year for the new car? But if we suddenly get a cancer diagnosis, we just start wondering what we're going to be facing. Are we going to survive and be around at all? When the pressure is on, the only thing that ever matters is the basics. We quickly, like instantaneously, weed through what is important and what is really not that important. Paul, in this little text here in Ephesians chapter 1, is getting back to the basics, and he's hoping to take us back to the basics. He's saying, look, there's really only a few things that are all that important. And he mentions three of them in this text. The first is we need to know him. We need to know him. I have talked to people from less prosperous countries who bemoan the fact that it seems like people in our country, in the United States, don't seem to care all that much about God. Don't seem to have all that much time for Him. Often in the more impoverished countries, people have a lot more time for God. And they really 
seek him. Um, we experienced this in the Philippines, that people, they had a lot of time, and they loved to meet, they loved to gather. And if you're saying, say, we're going to have worship services every night down there in the hall, they'll all be there, it'll be full, because there's not a lot of other distractions there. Try to say, from this pulpit here, we're going to meet every night this week for worship. And some of you are thinking, well, go ahead, have fun. <laughs> because you're busy, you're distracted. You have a lot of other things going on. But I noticed in the Philippines that so many people were so happy and so content. And yet, when they, as some of you, I suppose, come to America or came to America, things change. They start off with a basic job and so happy to have a job. And soon the essentials of life are provided for. But then their sights change. They want more stuff. They want more comforts, and they work more, and their standard of living doesn't stay where they were so happy when they first got here, but it keeps increasing, increasing, and increasing. But there's less and less time for God, and God begins to get just scraps from the table. There's little time for reading the Word. Maybe they manage to show up for church most of the time, but there's no time to volunteer to help out with anything. There's no time to look around the neighborhood and see who they might serve. They're just plain too busy. They've forgotten the surpassing greatness of knowing God. It reminds me of the parable of the sower when Jesus said, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things comes in and chokes the word making it unfruitful. Paul here wants us to know that the greatest thing of all is to know Christ. That the greatest thing of all is to know Christ. Indeed, I count, he says, everything as loss because of the surpassing greatness, and I've slipped back into my other versions there, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. We're not talking about knowing about Christ, not more head knowledge. The Bible says demons believe and they tremble. But Paul's talking about really knowing Christ, really knowing him, to know his character and to have that kind of trust that you have when you really, really, really know someone in a personal way. All of us here know who Joe Biden is, but none of us knows him. We all know who Donald Trump is. Well, only is one of you here today that can say, I know Donald Trump. I've sat with him. I've eaten dinner with him. No, he's just a name out there. This kind of knowledge of God where we can say, I know him, does not come quickly. It does not come easily. And it doesn't come without a price. It comes from his word. That means it takes time to, to open it, to read it during the week. It comes from walking with him, going through life with him, hand in hand, calling upon him, um, starting the day with him, going to bed at night with him, just during the day, just speaking to him, talking to him, sharing with him, asking for his help throughout the day. It comes from stepping out and trusting him. That means taking risks, because it's only hard to trust when you're in the middle of a, of a risk that you're taking. It comes from going through the furnace. I don't think anybody can ever really know Christ without going through furnace times, affliction times, and holding on to him during those times, and coming out on the other end and saying, I know Jesus. I know Christ. He was there for me. Um, that kind of faith comes from walking with him through the furnace. You can't just get it easily. Somebody can't pass it, pass it to you. They can't hand it to you on your way out of the, of the building this morning. The young lad, David, learned from God when he was a shepherd boy. And he wrote that when he was a young boy tending his father's sheep, that if a bear or a wolf threatened the flock, he learned that God gave him power to overcome, to be victorious. And he took out that bear. He took out 
that wolf. And that served him really well, did it not, the day that he found himself standing before the giant Goliath. And everyone else, you know, they're scared. His brothers, the armies, the king was scared. And yet David had courage. He was indignant. Why are you all shugging your boots? This guy's nothing. God is on our side. He gained that kind of knowledge because he learned it in the fields. He learned it when the, the bear or the wolf threatened his dad's sheep. And the experience with Goliath that day served him very well the rest of his life. And I think of the day when he returned to Ziklag with his army, and they learned that all of their wives, all of their children had been taken captive, and his own men were saying, we ought to stone you, David. But his experience with God, his knowing God, served him well in that latest fiery furnace. My friends, there's, there's no shortcuts to this kind of knowledge of God. There's no way you can get it easily. No way you get it instantaneously. You don't get it the day that you're saved. It comes over time as you walk with him. And once you, you gain it, once you have it, nobody can take it away from you. It's yours. It's your experience with God. And nobody can steal it from you. You don't get it from a Bible school or seminary. I've been to both. But a Bible school doesn't hand you a knowledge of God. Because you get a certificate doesn't mean you know Jesus now. If you go ahead and get a master's degree from a seminary, which I have, that does not give you a knowledge of God. It gives you a lot of knowledge about God. It gives you a lot of knowledge about the Bible and Greek and Hebrew and all those things. But it doesn't give you knowledge about God. Knowledge from God doesn't come from, it doesn't come very much, at least, from mountaintop experiences. I believe it comes a lot more from pressure cooker experiences. When you're really, push comes to shove, you're desperate, you don't know how it's going to come out on the other end. But once you have that kind of knowledge of Jesus, nobody can take it from you. There's an old, old Christian song. I learned it in my youth. I don't know if anybody here even remembers the chorus, but part of it was, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. I almost want to break into the melody, but I'll, I'll spare you this morning. You can't draw from another's well, and they can't draw from yours. I don't know if you ever know anybody that tried to take water from your well. I think um, as a pastor, I think people often go, I take water from my well. You know, well, their faith is weak, but they think somehow I have the inside connection. You know, that's how people think. Some of you think that way, probably. But... You all can have the inside connection. You can all have that same well that runs deep. It can run deeper than my well. And God wants you to have your own well that you draw upon, not when things get tough. Well, I don't have any resources. I better rely upon the pastor's faith because he's got that inside connection with God going. Number two thing that Paul wants us to really, really know. He wants us to know the hope to which he has called us the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The state of Illinois keeps a list of thousands of people who have money coming to them but don't know it. And for years and years, it would appear in the newspaper every year. And, and I remember back in the day when I subscribed to the Tribune or the News Summer, whatever, you know, it would be a certain day in the year, you open it and all these pages of tiny, tiny fine print with names of people from all over the state of Illinois that have money coming to them, but somehow they forgot about it, they didn't know about it, and it's just sitting somewhere in the state of Illinois coffers. It could be an old forgotten bank account or a refund from a cell phone company or even an unclaimed paycheck or a, a tax refund check. Did you know that as of April 2023, now don't, don't start checking and looking for your lost money as Right now, you can do that later. As of April 2023, the state of Illinois currently has $3.5 billion that belongs to the great citizens of the state of Illinois. And if they don't claim it within a certain period of time, guess where the money goes? To the state, right? 
You never think too hard to know where it goes. It goes to the state. And isn't it surprising that so many people have so much money that they know nothing about? That there's money out there that's theirs, and yet they do not know it. And yet, so many Christians, so many believers, have spiritual riches that they know nothing about or very little about. They live as spiritual paupers, not knowing that they've been named in the will, that God has given an inheritance to them. That's what Paul's talking about. That was a problem in Paul's day. It's why he wrote what he did in Ephesians, and it's still vastly a problem in our day. Sometimes we don't know that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. The Bible says it is. And we let the enemy bully us around, not knowing the riches of the glorious inheritance that is ours because we've been adopted into the family of God. If God were to post a list online, because that's where Illinois does it now, of Christians who have unclaimed spiritual riches, I wonder if our name would be on it. If God published a list of you know, people that have spiritual riches that are unclaimed, would we look at that list and look under the J's and find George P. Jones there? Would you find your name listed there? I hope we know what is ours. What is ours? Some of the things that are ours. Forgiveness instead of shame. Satan always shames us, reminds us of our sins. Yes, they were real. But if we were in Christ, they're forgiven. But Satan won't tell us that. He'll just make us feel ashamed. People sometimes shame us, don't they? I mean, it's actually quite common. People shame us. But there's forgiveness for us instead of shame. There's the promise of a hope and a future, according to Jeremiah 29, 11. How many people have relied upon that? Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards, these says, towards thee, says the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you a hope and a future. The ability to tear down strongholds with our prayers. The promise from Romans 8 that if that anything that happens to us, God will turn it around for good. Even if the enemy meant it for harm, God will turn it around for our good because we love him and because we've been called according to his purposes. In fact, every promise that we find in the Holy Scriptures is ours. And yet a lot of us have unclaimed spiritual riches. Our name is on the list. We have something that's ours. We haven't claimed it yet. The number, thir number three thing, third thing that Paul wants us to know is his, not Paul's, but Christ's incomparably, incomparably great power for us who believe. I've heard of cultures that are so filled with occult religions, practices, witchcraft, voodoo, demonic manifestations, that no one denies for a second the reality of the supernatural. Everybody believes in gods and demons in these cultures. And in those cultures, people tend not to pursue truth, but they pursue power. And whichever religion, whoever it is, if it seems more powerful than the next one, they'll sign up for that one. Then when they find out that this religion over here, this one with the maybe voodoo, seems more powerful than the last one, well then we'll shift to that one. They go for where the power is, not where the truth is. They put their trust in whatever God they perceive to be the most powerful, not the one who they discern is the most truthful. And even though in America there is almost a non-belief in the supernatural, people are still looking for a religion that works. They're still looking for something that really works, not just another brand of religion. The Bible says in the last days, many would have the appearance of godliness, but deny its power. And there are many churches today, I could name them, I could name the types of churches I'm thinking about, that have a, a great guise of godliness and of religion, and yet they deny the power of the Lord. It's just a guise. It's just religion. It's just practice. But there's no power 
because they have forsaken the truth of the Scripture. And so that means that people in our day, and probably in every day since the creation of man, are very religious, but they don't believe there's any real power there. It's like, well, if it works for you, good. If you want to do that, fine. But they don't really think there's a, a serious source of power there. It's just a practice, just something that you've signed up, up for. Much of what passes for Christianity is a powerless religion because we don't know the power that God has given us. It's an unclaimed rich, riches, part of the unclaimed riches. And Paul wants us to know, he says, the incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul says this power is for us who believe, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Now, does that sound like impotence to you? Does that sound like powerlessness? Does it sound like just some kind of empty practice of a ritual to you? No, it sounds explosive. It sounds like dynamite kind of power. It's not marginal, it's explosive. And that's the kind of power that, that Paul is saying is at work in every believer. And yet for many of us, it's unclaimed. It's just sitting there. We don't know it, we don't believe it, we don't rely upon it. It's... It's like it doesn't exist. Paul says it's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So the Bible is telling us that the same power that raised Jesus, who had been tortured, crucified, killed, laid in a cold, dank tomb for three days, and then suddenly raised him from the dead, completely alive, completely well, healthy, completely triumphant over death, three days later, our scripture is saying that that same power is at work in you. See what I mean by how unclaimed this is? We walk around like, where's God? He's left me. He's forsaken me. And yet we have this power at work in us. But so often it's unclaimed. It's like we don't know it. We don't believe it. We can live there. And if we're not living there, why don't we live there? What's holding us back? What's the, what's the problem? The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And that verse in Romans is in the context of us not being controlled by our sinful flesh. Is there room to imagine a hopelessly addicted Christian. Do, do you see room here for just a hopelessly addicted Christian, and yet they have the explosive power of Christ at work in their body? Is there room here to imagine an utterly defeated Christian, just defeated at every turn? I think Paul will say, well, how's that possible? If you have the explosive resurrection power of Christ at work in you, how can you be utterly defeated? There is only room to picture a victorious life in Jesus because of the power that God gives to those who believe. It's, it's not an elusive power. It is available power. And there's various cults out there that have, have degrees you have to go through, and the higher you go, the more you are exposed to the secret knowledge Christianity is not a religion of secret knowledge where you have to attain to it, work hard, try to gain another, another level, another degree. It's out there for a child to understand. And praise God, we see it in little children. We see it in little children in our church. Praise God for that. It's not elusive. It's available. It's not for a select few. It's not just for you know, God's favorites. We just read this morning that Psalm 56 about how there's room for the foreigner 
in the family of God. They've got the same inheritance. Tell me that you are defeated as a believer. And I'll tell you that you have one of four problems. Either you haven't made up your mind who you're going to serve, and you're still on the fence, you're still questioning whether you want to live in the world or live in Christ, or you're trying to be a Christian in your own strength, and you think you have to do it yourself, you've got to you know, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and, and fight off every temptation by yourself and, and kind of you know, grit your teeth and make fists and, and push through, which will always lead you to failure, by the way. I've tried it. <laughs> or you don't know your benefits package as a Christian, or you're simply believing a lie instead of believing the truth. So three things that Paul wants us to know. We need to know him. Not know about him, but we need to know him. We need to know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. We need to know his incomparably mighty power for all of us who believe. Now, none of that is head knowledge. It's not what you get in a classroom. You might learn about it in a classroom. Maybe you get introduced to it in a classroom. But it's active knowledge. It's not passive. It's something that we take hold of. Amen? Amen. It's something that we walk in. We walk in. Whether you're in church or at home, whether you're all by yourself, you feel like a... Um, um, What's the expression I want? You're in, a, you're in a den of wolves where you're the only one left. Remember, that's how I felt so many years ago. I was 23 and worked for Westinghouse in Hunt Valley, Maryland. And, and I was struggling so much. I was struggling so much in my life. And, and working for that great big plant in, in Hunt Valley, I thought I was the only believer there. You know, I'm, I'm a lamb among wolves. I just thought I was the only one. There's nobody else here. And and I happened to, back in that day to have a Christian bumper sticker on my car. And I was sitting in my little car one day, probably, probably praying and crying without tears, if you know what I'm saying, because I have to go to work. And all of a sudden, this guy kind of tapped on my glass, a little car, and I opened it, and he said, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. He said, well, so am I. Do you know the other Christians here? I said, no, he was another engineer, a much older engineer. He said, meet me today at lunch. I'll take you around, introduce you to him. So he took me all around this, this big building we worked, and, you know, person after person is a believer. Here I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm the only one, only one left, Lord. Poor me. And God had a lot of believers in that place. And I found out there was a, a Bible study that met once a week in the conference room. And so there's all kinds of activity going on because um, God does always have his people. He always has his people. You may not see them. You might think you're the only one left, but there's others of you out there. So you drive your old car into the dealer. You look over the new cars. You test drive a few. You settle on one that you really like. You sit down with the salesman. You talk price. You negotiate. The sales manager, of course, comes out and gets involved and you settle on a deal, you shake hands on it, and then they take the new car in the back where they clean it up, exchange the tags, move the city sticker over, while you go to some fellow or gal who sits in an office, reviews all the paperwork, and tries to get you to buy a lot of other things, you know, the extra warranty, the rust proof, the, the, I, the one I really hate is the we etch on the glass, the serial number, so everybody steals. That's the one. I, I, I had a war with a dealer over that once. I said, I don't want to pay for that. And they said, well, we already did it. I said, well, I didn't ask you to do it. I don't want it. So he finally took like $200 off, and I went home with high blood pressure. Um, but, you, but you finally are done, and you walk out, but instead of getting in the new car and driving home, you go back to your plumper. And you drive that one home because you didn't take hold of the new car. You're still living like the old car is yours. And that's what a lot of believers do. 
they come into the faith, but they never take hold of the new life in Christ. Knowing him and knowing him the inheritance and knowing his power, and they just go back to, to living the old life with a, a new faith, and yet a faith that isn't really working all that well, isn't really that demonstrable. When Beth and I bought our new house about eight years ago, it took us at least two years and maybe even longer before it started feeling like our house. And we'd go home every day, go home after church, and Beth would say, this doesn't feel like our house. You know, it doesn't feel like our house to me either. I mean, it's like, is it ever going to, the odor is going to last this feeling that it's not home, even though we bought it and it is our house? I think it probably took two to three years before I could say, it's starting to feel like my house. Meanwhile, we just kept living in it. We kept going home to it. We kept acting like it was our house. We kept cutting the grass. We kept doing all the things you do, paid the bills for it. But you know, eventually it did start to feel like our house. It started feeling like home. And that is what believers must do. We take hold of a knowledge of Christ, a knowledge that's rooted in our scriptures, and we begin to act on it. We begin to treat it like, our, like it's ours. We begin to act like it's true, even though we're not sure yet. We're new in the faith. We're babies. And yet, over time, it becomes ours. It was ours, but we didn't know it. But over time, it comes to a place where we can say, this feels like mine now. This is where I live. I know him. I know the power of his resurrection. I know his incredibly great power for us who believe. So that's what God's word is talking about this morning. That's where Paul wanted the, pe the believers in Ephesus to be at, but they weren't, which is why he wrote it. And it's where God would want us at today at Family Life Church. Some of us are there, some of us aren't. But God would want all of us, just like that word from Georgia before, he wants all of us there to know God, to walk with him every day and know who he is and, and have a knowledge of, of Christ that is real, it's personal, and nobody can take it away from us. You know, one of the things they say about when you witness to people, when you're trying to share Jesus with them, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of methods, a lot of things you can do, and a lot of them are good and all. But when you are in those situations, you're just trying to talk to somebody, take time to share what Jesus has done in your life. Because that's something people can't take from you. They may argue with you about a lot of other things, but when you tell them what Jesus has done in your life, they usually get quiet and listen because they can't say, well, no, he didn't do that for you. Because you're sitting there saying, this is my experience. This is what I've seen. This is what the Lord did for me. Amen? Amen. Amen.